Welcome to the Lifter Story Podcast with guest Jennifer Gerald. Hi everyone, I am Lorianne. I am that gal from Milton, Ontario, Canada, and I am with. I am that guy. I am Roy Miller from Dallas, Texas, and welcome to our Lift Your Story podcast. So in this episode, we have Jennifer Gerald, and she is a two-time international best-selling author, musician, transformational life coach, and keynote speaker. Thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, Jennifer, since you're an author, can you tell us a little bit about your books? Well, I have three. Two of them went number one international, and those are co-author books that I got to be a part of with the One Habit Press. Uh The first number one international bestseller is the One Habit for Entrepreneurial Success, How to Turbocharge Your Business and Change Your Life. And then the second one is how to thrive in a post-COVID world, which we're all dealing with right now. And uh, so it was very exciting to be a part of both of those. I have a chapter in both of those books where I share four little secrets on how to get where you want to go one step at a time. And then the first book that I had published, uh, actually four days before the world was shut down, with coronavirus last year. So it was a little tricky getting all the publicity and and pushing it and getting it out there. So I hope to be able to do that this year is my own personal story. And it's called Dare to Heal, Thriving with BPD, which is Borderline Personality Disorder. And I was just only diagnosed with that back in 2015. And my world came crashing down in a moment's notice. But the book is about how I came up out of the downward spiral to living my best life by learning how to face challenges and obstacles and choose to live forward instead of to sit still and stay stuck. You have quite a few of those. I was reading your bio and yes, you've come through quite a few challenges. Just a couple. (laughs) Well, if you don't mind me asking... You said this was in 2015 that, that this happened, right? The diagnosis, yes. Right. But but you've been suffering from this for a while. You just didn't realize what it was until 2015? Correct. I had been treated for depression and anxiety, mood disorders. I had been on, I'd been in counseling since I was a little girl. I'd been on a myriad of different um altering medications to try to fix the depression and the anxiety and the sleep disorder and the eating disorder. And, um, and I just kept saying, it's not working. It's not working. It's not working. And they'd say, you're not giving it enough time. And I'm like, it's been six months. (laughs) I would think I'd feel something. And so I walked into my counselor's office, just really long faced. I had a, a dear friend. She said, I think you have bipolar. And I was like, oh, and, and that has a stigma. I mean, it's mental illness, but it still has, it's a stigma, whether we want to admit that or not, it's the truth. And so I walked into my, my counselor's office and I said, okay, I've been in counseling for 10 years. I have learned all these great skills and nobody around me is changing. Nobody. Well, you think, because who, who are the tools for? <laughs> So I said to her, I said, okay, over the last 10 years, the only common denominator is me. Is the problem me? And my friend thinks that I have bipolar. Is there a test for that? And she said, there is. And so we did the test and she says, well, the good news is you don't have bipolar. And I was like, oh, there's a butt coming. (laughs) She says, yeah, but you do have borderline personality disorder. And it was in that moment that I, I think felt the smallest I'd ever felt in my life. I felt deflated, defeated, and completely invisible. And I thought, well, the world would probably be better without this monster. Because in that moment, what I knew about borderline personality disorder was little, but what I did know was not good. And I thought, oh, my kids would be better off without me. The world would be better off without me. And I took a long, well, it felt like a long walk, but it was really a short walk to my car in the middle of a hot summer day. And I locked myself inside. 
And I knew based on everything I'd seen on the news that it was only going to take 20 minutes and all this pain and all this suffering and all this defeat and smallness was just going to go away because I was going to die. And I closed my eyes and I laid back and I waited. And two and a half hours later, I woke up and went, why am I still here? What in the I was groggy and I was confused and I was soaking wet and I was mad as a hornet. <laughs> but I knew in that moment I had to make a choice. Sit in the car and wait to die or open the door and learn to live. And I made a choice to open the door and learn to live differently. And that's why I'm here today. For our listeners, can you can you kind of tell us what exactly borderline uh, personality, personality is? Or- yeah, it's, it's a new one for a lot of people. And honestly, it's very missed because it, it, it mirrors bipolar disorder. Um, some of the main characteristic differences between them are the bipolar disorder, the mood swings, the highs and the lows. They last for longer periods of time where somebody that's suffering from borderline personality disorder, they couldn't go high, low, high, low, high, low, six, seven, 10 times a day. And it's just, it's a, it's a roller coaster. Um, Borderline personality disorder is not a chemical imbalance. That is one of the biggest key factors. It is a mental illness that is built by trauma, invalidation, and, and, disarray in in one's upbringing and it can start at birth and it starts to rear its ugly head when puberty kicks in you start to really see the characteristics and it's high risk behavior uh violent outbursts mood swings um and then it hits its all-time high about the age of 25 and if it's not caught it's harder to turn it around. I was very blessed because I was a little older than 25 when I got diagnosed and being tenacious and resilient, I was like, Oh, well, now that I know what it is and I know that I can work with it, I'm going to, I'm going to get to work and do that. So the borderline personality disorder, it's tricky. It's really tricky and it is not easy to live with. I can't imagine what what my husband was going through when we didn't know what I had. <laughs> and my, uh, my niece had that as well. Unfortunately, she's not with us today. Uh, but what they did say, uh, and unfortunately she did not go through, but apparently cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the top things that they recommend for that. Uh, Actually dialectical behavioral therapy. Is that okay? That's a new yeah. one. So the yeah. other one as well was, was mentioned yeah. for her to her mother. The cognitive behavioral therapy is your traditional counseling where it addresses behaviors and attitudes um, and it breaks patterns of behavior. The dialectical behavioral therapy, the DBT, which I would just love for it to be available to the whole world. I am, I am going to be the spokesperson for DBT if it's the last thing that I do. Dialectical behavioral therapy is all about emotion regulation. And as an individual who suffers from emotional overwhelm without the skill and ability to regulate those emotions, that's where the risky behaviors come in. The acting out comes in. Okay. Um, excessive drinking, drug exposure. Um, a, there's addictions to all kinds of things, sex, shoplifting, um, pornography there there's a very addictive behavior around the borderline personality disorder and the inability to regulate emotion they're looking for anything that's going to either make them feel better or give them that rush if you will or they're looking for something that's going to slow the spin down so they don't have to feel it because they don't know how to regulate it and so the dialectical behavioral therapy teaches incredible things and in between each lesson we learn mindfulness (laughs) mindfulness <laughs> how to breathe how to focus on something else different activities to uh change the the pattern of the brainwave that's causing the spin out it's very very 
intense therapy. That's why they call it uh, IOP intensive outpatient therapy. <laughs> and so, I mean, I walked in there, I was going in for DBT, IOP for DBT for BPD. It was like a bowl of alphabet soup. And I had no clue what I was walking into. And it was so scary. And I had a wicked chip on my shoulder that was weighing me down. And then I realized in a moment after I had a couple of bad attitude moments, <laughs> Uh, I don't want to be there. I was like, oh, I don't fit in here. These people, I don't want to be around these people. I'm not one of these people. And then I realized, oh, it's one of these people. <laughs> I had the same problem, even though I look different and I came from different circumstances. We were all fighting a similar war. And, um, but that DBT was the key to learning how to live my best life. And the moment I realized that every single tool that I was being taught was going to be a permanent skill. It was going to change the trajectory of my life, my children's lives, the lives of my clients, and ultimately the, the overall outcome of my life. And that's when I just dug deep. I stopped worrying about everybody else. I started to let go of judgment and I did the work. And it was doing the work and getting dirty and pulling back all those emotional scabs and letting the wound open up so it could truly heal. That's where, that's where the real transformation began. And that's how I became so passionate about helping others to transform because we don't have to stay stuck. That's a choice. Thanks for sharing that. I had not heard of that before. So that's, that's a good one for our listeners because I'm sure that there's a lot of people out there with either the personality, uh, borderline personality disorder, or with people around it, that they're being veered towards the, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy without even knowing about this, because I had yeah. heard of it. So thank you for sharing that. You're yeah. welcome. Thanks for asking about that. You know, it's interesting, you know, you've been struggling with this for a long period of time, and you just mentioned in a moment it changed, you know. That's interesting that just that one little thing made all the difference. Yes. And I'd heard for years from like Stephen R. Covey and lots of speakers, Tony Robbins, Les Brown. I, I've followed that kind of stuff my whole life. I just love it. And I had heard the term paradigm shift mm -hmm. and I never really understood that. And until that moment, I was like, oh is this my paradigm shift? Is this that moment we're on the tip of a crystal or the head of a pin that one tiny choice makes all the difference? And it's, it, it, there's so many different analogies that I could probably come up with. I, I love analogies and acronyms and, and picture stories because it helps people to really register. But it was like, you, when you say, oh, I'm on the fence, well, okay. Or I'm borderline. Um, recently, I had a, a loved one say, what, what are you doing with your life right now? I mean, you can't do this. You're, you're borderline personality disorder. And I said, ah, but you know what the best part about being borderline is? I get to choose which side of the line I'm on. So, so if somebody out there that's listening is sitting on the fence and they feel that overwhelm and they're not sure if there's something that is that that's going to be right for them, check out DBT, decide which side of the fence you want to stay sad and blue and dark and gloomy, or do you want to do something? The world says you can't a lot of the times, but God says you can and if you realize that there is a power greater than yourself, which is what I had to do, I had to humble myself and realize I couldn't do this by myself. I had to look up whether you, you or the listeners referred to that higher power as a higher power or God or Buddha or Allah, or just the universe. We are all part of something and there is something greater than all of us. And if we recognize that and realize we have a greater power to lean on than just ourselves, the jump is a lot easier and the landing is a lot softer. <laughs> I, have a, 
quick question for you. I don't know. I know that um, my niece struggle with this, but I heard that it's common with uh, borderline uh, personality disorder is the dissociation. Did you have any feelings about that? Not being able to associate yourself in certain situations? They call it dissociation, I believe, right now. It dissociation is the inability to connect mm -hmm. uh, or relate to. And I would have to say that I am very fortunate because I am an empath. Even with my struggles, I've been able to stay connected to people. I've been able to stay connected to situations sometimes more than I should be. And um, it was harder for me to let go of things versus to be able to dissociate. I didn't compartmentalize like a lot of them do. Um, uh, I heard a psychologist give a talk once said a woman's brain is like a ball of wire where everything's connected to everything and men's brains are like boxes and they can't touch. And in borderline personality disorder, a lot of times that box compartmentalization can happen. And the, that's where the disassociation comes in. I was fortunate enough to stay woman with a ball of wire that was connected to everything and unfortunate too, because I couldn't disassociate. So it could go either way. For me, I was too connected to everything. For others, they disconnect from everything. Thank so. you. That's a, that's a, I like that analogy. That really, that really makes it clear. And I agree, we are, guys are that way. Yeah, yeah, I, I have to totally agree with you. I have to totally agree with you on that one. Yeah, we are the box. <laughs> it's, it's one of my favorite talks. He, he's kind of a comedian too, and I just love it because he says the men have a box. It's their nothing box. And nothing drives a woman crazier than watching a man do nothing. <laughs> so I, just, I just chuckle. And sometimes I'm like, gosh, I wish I had a nothing box. <laughs> I wish I could just sit and do nothing. <laughs> But when I sit and do nothing, I think about everything I should be doing. So it's yeah. really not nothing at all. <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of like they say, women wonder what men are thinking about. Yeah, <laughs> nothing. We, we, we don't think. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so. tell us a little bit about your, your history. Ah, oh, my history. It is, it is a beautiful disaster. I think Kelly Gorgson wrote that song. And uh, it started young, unfortunately. My innocence was broken at about six years old uh, when I was introduced to pornography and sexual touch. Um, I learned later that was called sexual abuse. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's terrible. Um, there, there was a lot of um, discord growing up. You know, no family's perfect, but there was discord. We moved a lot. I was hard to get attached to people. My father was in the military, so we moved every two, two and a half years. Um, there, was, there was some physical abuse. There was some verbal abuse. There was bullying at school. I was always an overweight child and I am blind in this eye right here. So if um, she's looking over this way, it's because she's looking for other opportunities. Just saying um, this, my green eye, I have a green eye and a brown eye. My green eye is the one I can see out of and it's just laser focused. So, but in school, I got teased for that because people always thought I was glaring at them because I kind of squint a little because this one doesn't dilate doesn't adjust to the light and so learning how to do all these interviews with bright lights in your face that's one keep your eyes open um so anyway i got bullied and then i suffered from an eating disorder and um unfortunately my eating disorder didn't make me thin it continued to add pounds uh, as a form of shelter and safety or illusion of shelter and safety. If I'm overweight, then people won't want to hurt me. If I'm overweight, then people won't want to get close to me. And if people don't get close to me, then I don't have to worry about losing anybody. And so I spent the majority of my young years morbidly obese. I'm only five foot one. And I topped out at one point at 280 pounds. And, uh, I was dying. I was dying. I was so young 
and I had the comorbidities of an 85 year old. So I guess you could say I'd been trying to kill myself for a long time. I just didn't know it. (laughs) And then, um, I, you know, I've been through divorce, bankruptcy. I've been, I have been through the near death, uh, near death car accident. I've gone through 23 major surgeries just to stay alive from accidents, injuries, and birth trauma. And so there's been a lot of things that a lot of people could say, well, gosh, I can't even believe you're still standing. Well, some days I can't believe I'm still standing either, but it's that resilience and that choice to push through that has always kept me going. Even when I didn't realize I was that strong. But the fact that I'm here today, being able to share my story with you and your listeners means I have a hundred percent success rate of getting through difficult days. And so if there's anyone out there that's listening, that's going, man, my life just sucks. And I don't know how to get up and keep going. Um, get up <laughs> keep going. If I can do it, you can do it. And, um, and no amount of tragedy is an excuse to stay away from triumph. Yeah. So all those things in your background that were really, I'll just say tragic in some form or another, you know, all of that brought you to where you are today. Yes. And you were able to, even looking back and maybe having the bad feelings that, that you remember from childhood and all that, now, that's what got you where you can kind of put it back in that box, move forward and just think, boy, look at all the lessons I learned and think the things that I've overcame. So now I'm unstoppable. I am unstoppable. I actually just wrote a song with some of those words in it. It does. It's not unstoppable. It's actually a song. It's called mirror. And it's my journey from that scared little six-year-old girl hiding in a corner afraid to be hurt because her world was shattered. Uh, She's called to a mirror by a voice that knows her name and scared. She cries out and says, who are you? The shattered voice calls out and fills the empty room. Who are you? So lost, so scared. She cries. Who are you? The mirror replies, I am you. And the mirror beckons her to come and look in She says, look in, it's just a piece of glass. I'm looking back at you. Small and scared, she looks into the glass on the wall and sees herself looking back, but beautiful, courageous, and tall. A shattered girl in pieces now begins to see all the things God planned through every tragedy. The mirror on the dark wall shows a piece of me. I am not small, I am not weak, I am not shattered. My reflection shows God's perfect girl a miracle. Oh, that's awesome. That, you, need, so, you need to publish that. You need to write that down as a poem. <laughs> it actually has musical background. I'll be singing it next week on a, a summit. That's very inspiration. <laughs> Thank you. It, it was a challenge. I actually was challenged to write it to debut it in Texas. And so I debuted it live in Texas three weeks ago. And it was it was so much fun. So as it should be in yeah. Texas. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yes. I, had the fedora, I had my fedora on and everything. We were ready to go. So, but that, and, and, I, and I really hope that the listeners hear that, that uh, God had a plan for every tragedy. He doesn't give us tragedies. Tragedies happen, but he will give us the strength to get through them if we will just look up and, and stop saying, why me? The victim says, why me? I say, the warrior says, show me. This is wonderful. And you've been doing some keynote speaking. And now that Mm -hmm. COVID will slowly be opening up, you'll have some more opportunities to do that. So congratulations (laughs) on that. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your music. Ah, music's part of my love life. Um, It's my bloodline. It keeps me going. It always has. I have written poetry for many, many years, and I always had dreams of sitting at the piano and singing and playing, but I didn't know how to do that. (laughs) And then 
um, my son one day he was sitting at the piano and he was singing and playing. And I was like, how are you doing that? He says, oh, I'm just using guitar tabs. I go, what? He's like, guitar tabs. And I was like, there's got to be an app for that. And so I, <laughs> I downloaded an app and I started learning how to play chords by looking at a piece of paper with just the words and the chords above the words. And I was like, woo. And then, and then I was like, oh, I want to play the guitar. Cause my, my husband was learning how to play the guitar. And I thought I've had a guitar for 20 years, never learned how to play it. So I started messing around and I started learning how to play the guitar. I was like, woo. And then I was like, oh, oh, I know how to do chords now. I wonder if I can write a song. <laughs> so uh, three and a half years ago, I wrote my first song uh, dedicated to my husband. It's called Believe. It's my journey back to faith uh, because I had turned my back on God because I thought he turned his back on me. And my sweet husband, as my friend, we just got married in June of last year. Uh, my husband brought me back to faith through prayer as my friend and taught me that I didn't have to be perfect to address my heavenly father and get answers. And so that was my first song. And then I wrote another song and then I wrote my, when I know Lori Ann's heard me sing snippets of it, it's called sitting on the sidelines. <laughs> I always sing a snippet of that one. Um, through a friend of mine, Jason W. Freeman, author of Awkwardly Awesome, Embracing Your Imperfect Best, loved his message, got permission to write a song. And then I wrote one for my niece who passed away in July of 2019 from breast cancer. Um, it's her life memoir. It's called Wounded Warrior. And then now I have my fifth one that was the challenge to write a song about bringing together the broken little girl and the whole woman. And so that's kind of where my musical journey is. I'm learning about uh, recording and uploading and selling tracks. And it's like a new little wrinkle every day. Thank <laughs> God they're in my brain and not on my face. But, <laughs> but that's my musical journey. I've always sung. I've always loved to perform. And now I get to do both covers and originals. And I am feeling more and more complete every day. <laughs> it's like, yay, it's coming. Here we are. Well, how can our listeners reach out to you? They can reach out to me at jennifergerald.com. That's the basic contact form. Uh, they can also reach out and learn some of the skills that I've harnessed and turned into focus, F-O-C-U-S. If they're feeling overwhelmed, but they're not really ready to talk to somebody yet, that's okay. I have a free download for them. It's their step-by-step -step guide on how to harness fear and transform it into focus for ultimate emotional success. And they can get that at jennifergerald.com forward slash contact dash us. And um, that's the best way, but I'm on social media as well. Instagram, Clubhouse, Facebook, LinkedIn, and I make it so simple. It's just my name. Jennifer Gerald. <laughs> and your books are available on Amazon. They are available on Amazon, or they can just click right on my book link from my website as well. It'll take them to Amazon. Okay. So, but yes, they're all available. They're all there. And if they live local, they can buy their book and I'll be happy to sign it for them. <laughs> cool. Always nice to get a signed copy of a book. Yeah. It's a little bit more personalized. <laughs> Absolutely. I haven't figured out how to do the pre-order pre-signed books yet, but maybe that'll be my next question for my next mastermind meeting. Because <laughs> yeah. I would love to do that. The next wrinkle on your brain, not your face. Next wrinkle right? in my brain. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. that. I got as wrinkles as you can to your brain. Save your face for later. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much for sharing today, Jennifer. It's been wonderful having you on the show. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you again for having me. And I look forward to being able to work with you again. Thank you. Right. Yeah, it was it was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you for listening to this episode. Be sure to visit us at lifterstory.com.